Hello, my name is Dr. Jamar Tisby and welcome to the next installment of Those Meddling Kids. We are unmasking the anti-CRT crusade in Christian higher ed. And where does that name come from? Do y'all remember Scooby-Doo? I don't know if Gen Z or younger remembers those Scooby-Doo movies, but at the end of this big mystery, they would unmask the villain. They would unmask the culprit. They said, and I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for those meddling kids. So we're talking about Christian college students or, or students in, um, colleges and universities that that brand themselves as Christian and and these students have the audacity and the unmitigated gall to want to learn more about racial justice and think that their schools should help them. So we we're doing this series and my guest today I am very honored to say is a very good friend of mine. This is Dr. Malcolm Foley. Welcome to those meddling kids, brother. It's it's good to be it's good to be with you, Jamar. Absolutely. Now, for those of you who who don't have the blessing and the privilege that I have of knowing you, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your educational background and training, as well as your current occupation. Sure. So I I did my undergrad at Washington St. Louis. Did a double major in religious studies and finance with a classics minor. The classics was just all 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 ancient Greek. Did my did my master of, of divinity at Yale at Yale Divinity School focused basically exclusively on the early and, and medieval church. Uh, I kind of avoided uh, specifically race. I did I didn't want to be I didn't I, I didn't want to be pigeonholed as the black yeah. guy who does, does work on race. Um, but then but then did my PhD at Baylor at Baylor University in the in the religion department specifically uh, the history the history of Christianity and and my dissertation was on. Black Protestant responses to lynching in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, right now, I serve uh, as a member of Baylor's administration, as a special advisor to the president for equity and campus engagement. I also serve as the as the director of Black Church Studies at Truett Seminary. So, few Woo! few jobs, <laughs> very extensive bio and incredible credentials. So, I just want folks to to hear. I mean, you 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 have a very uh, a varied educational background from Wash U to Yale Div to Baylor, and you you teach and you are working on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion at a Christian college, and you pastor as well. Also pastor. <laughs> that, is, that is also true. <laughs> yes, yes. So again, just just a, 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 a an ideal person to have on this series to help us understand these things. We're talking specifically today about the anti-racist tradition of the black church. But before we dive into it, the context is this anti-critical race theory crusade, as I'm calling it, that's happening all over the place, but specifically at Christian colleges and universities. Now, I know you don't necessarily brand yourself as a CRT expert, but we've all had to come to grips with this this crusade what do you yeah. think is important for people to know more accurate information for people to know about critical race theory from your viewpoint yeah so I, a number of close close friends of mine so uh for example i think of my friend uh, uh nathan nathan cartagena who's doing who's doing really good work teaching not only teaching at wheaton but also writing a book on christianity and critical race theory i think one of the most one of the most helpful things that it that it that it offers us is an understanding of the way that of the way that race works. Um, I think I think a lot of I think a lot of conversation around race focuses on kind of thought and ideology and things like that. One of the one of the one of the things that critical race theory offers is an is an account of how race is constructed, particularly by particularly by the law, um, and also also just in its in its in its historical framing of the way that race actually works works in our society the way that it the way that it the, the way that the way that its formation actually oppresses people the way that it the way the, uh, uh, the way that in many ways american law and culture has been shaped around this around this idea um crit critical race theory as a as a field i think gives us gives us some really helpful some really helpful frameworks for understand for not only understanding how it works but also but also understanding how to how to how to resist how to how to resist that exploitation so it, it's it's moving from the realm of 
abstract ideas and definitions and saying, okay, but this is how it actually gets embedded in the way we do life in our in our nation and in the world, really. So I appreciate that um, emphasis on the practical, and we'll certainly be talking more about that. Now, in this con this sort of anti CRT crusade, what I detect is kind of the underlying assumption that real Christianity or true Christianity is that which arises from European and white U.S. theologians. Mm. Um, mm. That's the, it may not ever be explicit, but when you look at who they reference and who they hold up as like exemplars, you get the message. So in your view, what do we lose? What do we lose when we understand Christian, Christianity mainly as European or Euro-American expressions of the faith? Yeah. It, it, would be, uh, it would be profoundly depressing if that, if that were the case. Uh, <laughs> it, would, it, it would also. But it, I, I mean, it, 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 it not only, um, I mean, it not only ignores especially the, um, I mean, a number, a number of the most prominent theologians in, in, in particularly the early church, uh, they're not, they're not European. Um, Europe, Europe gets, gets Christianity a little late. Um, but, but, but not, but not only that, when we, when we think in recent, in recent history, um, the, one of the, one of the things that, I think one of the massive benefits of particularly the black the black ecclesial tradition is that it's it's a church tradition that that it, that emerges that emerges out of out of persecution, so it emerges out of a out of a place of you know who is this who is who is this God in the midst of my oppression? I think about I think about the fact that the that the black American church comes comes out of slavery, um, and in and in many ways that is a context that is much closer to the biblical context. Than, than, than coming out of be, basically being the, being the settlers in a set, in a in a settler colonial state. So, so when you, so when you have people who, who approach the scriptures basically out of desperation, thinking what is it, what is it, what does it mean for God, for God to want to save me? Um, what does it mean for me to believe in a God who ultimately seeks to set me free rather than to just ja justify a status quo that leads to my death? Um, that seems to be a more accurate framing of the God of the scriptures than, for example, so as, so as a, so as an example, James, James Henley Thornwell, um, it's Presbyterian, pres Presbyterian pastor, Southern, Southern Presbyterian pastor, um, pro-slavery, pro-slavery apologist. In his in his sermon on the rights and duties of masters, one of the one of the things that he kind of emphasizes is that because Jesus uses slaves and masters in his parables, clearly he's perfectly fine with slavery. The South is doing it right, all good. Um, one of the one of the effects of that of that way of reading the scriptures is that basically he reads the scriptures as saying Jesus is a fan of the status quo, uh, regardless of how of how unjust that status quo may be, regardless of how many people are dying as a result of that status quo, because Jesus uses the language of slaves and masters, clearly, clearly he's a fan. Um, if that were the only way of reading the scripture that I had access to, uh, wouldn't want to read the scriptures. <laughs> but um, but when you but when you but when you contrast that with folks like David Walker, Frederick Douglass, others. Who who see who see who see who see in the scriptures? Wait a minute! This is a this is a God who actually wants to set his pe set people free. Um, then that it 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 also it also opens up a Christianity that is that is much more it's, it's much more faithful to its to its roots and also much more faithful to 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 Jesus. That's a splendid reflection, and 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 boiling it down, it's like the church uh, in the Bible was a church of marginalized people, oppressed people, people who were disempowered in various ways. And that's the context in which the church arose and grew. And for contemporary times, um, Christians who are in those contexts as well, uh, continuing to be marginalized and disempowered in different ways, we have something to say that's very valuable and very important. And what you're saying is that it actually mirrors the, the biblical context a bit more closely than uh, the people in power are on top of society. 
I think especially, you know, I think especially of James, of James, of James two five when James when James says, "Has has not God chosen chosen those who are who are, who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom?" He 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 he, he promised those who love him. Um, it's it's often the case that if we want to see what Christ, what kind of Christ like living looks like, we are, we have to we have or we have to look to the poor, the oppressed, and the, and the marginalized. That's what the that's what the entirety of the scriptures <laughs> seem to tell us oh, over and over and over again. Um, that would that would that would force a radical and much needed shift, I think, in the practice of Christianity in the United States for a lot of people, if we could just even grasp that one truth. Um, now, you, you're already getting at this, and I'm so glad you are. I'm trying to talk about what is the difference between mm -hmm. the black church tradition and the white U.S. church tradition? How does that show up? What does it look like? Because I can imagine some people saying, well, well we all read the same Bible. We all worship the same God. You know, there's no black church. There's no white church. How does, how does, how do these differences, what are the differences? How do they show up? So this also goes back to, so for example, um, I think it, I think it goes back to kind of the moral, the moral difference between um, predominant, basically predominantly and historically white churches and historically black churches. Um, I say, I say moral difference for an important reason. Um, so for, 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 for a number of, of historically black denominations, their origin is not um, just kind of black people getting together and being like, hey, we should have our own church because we're racially superior, something like that. What, What's that? What, what's actually the case is that, especially, um, you know, this and this and this happened even uh, even before the Civil War. You would have you would have black members of churches that would be multi ethnic. You'd have white people and, and black people worshiping together, but it was very clear: white people are in charge. Black people sit either in the back or in the or in the or, or in the balcony. So you would have groups of black members who would go who would go to their leadership and say, "Hey, our worship is being restricted. Can we go?" start a church over, over here and the response of the leadership was not repentance as it should have been hey we're restricting your worship we shouldn't be doing that let's find let's find ways for us to worship together because we are because we are the body of christ after all instead the response was okay you go over there we'll send somebody to watch you make sure you're not fomenting rebellion but go do your go go, go do your thing over there um that's largely the story of the founding of the ame um, of other of other of other black baptist churches and things like that and so and so already already you have the um basically all, already you have the, the 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 temptation to dominate is what is what separates is what separates those churches you have you have you, you have white leaders who didn't who didn't want to give up didn't want to give up that grasp on what they believe true christianity is and so, and that's a, and that's a tendency, that's a tendency that we're still, that we're still seeing, um, in, in, in our churches, in our churches today, um, kind of an unwillingness to, to under, to understand the fact that if it's true that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, then we can actually teach one another about what that, about what that commitment to Christ, to, to Christ looks like. Um, and so, 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 so historically, uh, that's what that's what ends up that's what ends up separating those 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 church traditions. When that when that happens in the nineteenth, you know, in the largely in the in the eighteenth and nineteenth century, the time. I mean, <laughs> after that, you have black churches that end up that um that that end up devoting a lot of their uh, a lot of their theological and ethical resources to not just resistance of slavery, but resistance of Jim Crow, resistance of lynching, the civil rights movement. All of these things pose ethical and theological questions that black people then have to that 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 that, that black people have to work through in ways that a number of white Christians don't. So you get to a point now where you have folks who haven't had to ask those questions end up having a uh, an ethical disadvantage, we'll say, um, where those where those muscles those muscles have atrophied because they haven't had to ask they haven't had to ask those questions. And so one of the things one of the one of the things that can that can that can definitely be learned is not only not only a theology of 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 suffering, but also a theology of resistance. 
to injustice, particularly because that's been because that's been at the core of much of the black ecclesial tradition. There's been there's there's not only been kind of time and biblical interpretation, but also theological reflection to think through what is or what does it mean to faithfully affirm life in the midst of a culture of death. Um, so those are those are just a few just a few things. We've been talking in generalities, certainly about quote unquote the white church. We know there's a spectrum from fundamentalist to evangelical to Pentecostal to mainline, all of those things. But there's also a spectrum and a diversity among the black church. In fact, there's no quote unquote the <laughs> black church. Uh, can you help us unpack some of the diversity? of black church tradition, some of the things that we should be aware of that might be different, you know, within the, the broader black church tradition. Yeah. So there's, so there's not only, there's not only the kind of the, you know, the kind of denominational, um, the kind of denominational diversity where you, where you've got, I mean, you've got black, black Pentecostal denominations, Baptist, Methodist. Um, but I mean, you know, it's, there's a, there's, there's there's a there's a political diversity intellectual diversity so one of the things that so i i did my dissertation on as i said black protestant resistance to lynching and you have and you have and you have black protestants particularly across across the spectrum of thinking about what what the right what the right response to to ra- to racial terror lynching is you have you have you have you have thousands of black of black men women and in some cases children killed by Killed, killed by mobs from the late from, from the late nineteenth century through the mid twentieth century, and 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 when this and when this culture of death kind of hits people, there are there are a number of different there are a number of different responses. There are some there are some who say, "Hey, we need to you know as long as we as long as we pray hard enough, the Lord the Lord will deliver us." There are others who are going to say, "Hey, we need to vote for this person, vote for this law. We need to boycott these folks." Um, there are some. The, there are some who are going to say, "Hey, if we if we stop committing if we stop committing these crimes that they that they accuse us of, then they'll stop that then they'll stop killing us." Um, and then there are others who are going to say, "Hey, the only way the only way that we stop this from happening is if we take up arms to defend ourselves." Um, it's especially when you get especially when you get these kinds of these kinds of moments. It's it's also I mean this this diversity is 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 clear in the civil rights movement. It's clear. Even, even in, even in, uh, even in the tradition of abolitionism, this diversity is all the 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 diversity is always is always there, um, and that's and and that's something I think that's something that we can that we can learn that we can learn a lot from we can learn a lot from too um, to to expect that rather than to it's it's much easier to think about people in a monolith. Uh, cause then we, cause, cause then we can categorize, I mean, this is, this is also one of the, uh, it's one of the ways that racialized thinking, thinking works too, is that it's, it's, it's much easier, it's much easier to conceive of someone as part of a, as part of a group that I've put these definitions on, um, as opposed to thinking through what does it mean for me to love this person given their, given their context, given all of those, all those things. But, um, but yeah, I think that I think that diversity is something to something to expect and something to applaud. Well, let's let's get practical here. Let's yeah. let's think about Christian um, colleges and universities. Let's think about the students there. Yeah. If I am a student at one of these places, which is waging this anti CRT crusade, yeah. uh, first question is how can I get a robust education that recognizes that white Christianity isn't the only show in town? Yeah. I think one of the, I mean, first, first it's, it's to, it's to introduce yourself and there, and there, and, and there are a number of, um, there are a number of ways to, ways to do this, to introduce, to, to familiarize yourself with, 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 with church history and other theological traditions. So for example, there's a, there's a massive book of, uh, I, I think it's just called majority world, majority world theology. Um, and not just, not just that, but also, um, I mean, black theologians and others, um, what they will, what, th- what that experience will show you is that everyone is not asking the same questions. And, and, 
and and once you and once you find that and, and, and once you find that out you in the space that you're in can can also begin to ask different questions and so when you're so so when you're so when you're in your classes and you notice that your syllabi are are only let's say they're let's say it's just an all male syllabi or an all or an all white syllabi syllabus sorry then then that you're you're going to be in a position where you can start asking the questions of, "Hey, I have this, I have this theological or ethical question. Does do these works give me the resources to be able to answer that question? If they don't, that gives you that's that's something to bring up in class. It's like, hey, I, what about well, what about this? Um, when you when you and when you ask these kinds of questions, like this is how this is how the syllabi for your classes change is when students is when students bring up these things to professors and they're like, oh. I should probably I should probably deal with that next time. Um, it's it, these are the it, it, this is this is this is some of the kind of grassroots work um, of doing uh, of 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 really shifting really shifting people's not not just people's mindsets but all but ultimately shifting shifting systems in many in, in, in many ways like like I mean the movements that that created Black Studies in a number of in a number of uh, of colleges and universities, was started by students. Um, it's 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 because of it's because of the, it, 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 it's because of the questions that you ask, because of the organizing that you do, that a number of administrators and professors like that's what that's what that's what really changes things. So so sometimes it's going to begin with you exposing yourself to these other traditions so that you understand the kinds of questions that people are actually asking, rather than. The questions that you may be being told matter. Well, there may be questions that you, the questions that you have also matter, um, and and you should have and you should have the resources to be able to, if not if not answer them, to to, ro- to robustly engage them. That's fantastic. That 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 change and even the change in a syllabus can arise from student questions. So just encouraging students. Ask those questions, ask the questions that matter to you and ask whether what you're being told is important. I like the way you put that is actually important or, or, or at least as relevant to you as, as you want it to be. Your education is your education. So make it your own and take initiative by asking those questions. So you also teach and you teach in a higher ed setting. If I'm a professor, uh, if I'm an educator, how can I make sure that I am not being too Eurocentric or white centric in my teaching. What are the practices that you would encourage folks to to employ? Yeah, I think it's I think it's important to always remember that um, even though there is so it, as a as a as a professor, there is a sense in which you are you are the expert in the room, um, and there is and there is. Uh, and there is respect that you that you that you deserve in that in that in that context, but there also but there also has 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 to be the understanding that you're not the only that you're not the only knowledgeable person in the room. Um, that 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 students will bring not only not, not only their experiences but also but also but also their questions. Um, and there's a and there's a there's a mutuality, there's a mutuality to the classroom, um, that should be, that should, that should be evident too. It's also, it's also only through the, through the acknowledgement by acknowledging that mutuality that you can, that you can build trust in that, in that context too. Um, and the, and the best, and the best learning takes place in, in classrooms where there's trust, not only, not only, not only between the students themselves, but between the students and their uh, and their professor. When there's an understanding that, hey, this is a space where I can where I can ask these questions, and even if you don't know the answer, there's the there's the understanding. Hey, like I I see I see your question as important. Let's let's figure this out. Let's figure this out together. If I don't if, if I don't know it, um, that's the kind of context. Part of the teaching teaching is as much about content as it is about context. Um, and so, and so I think, so, 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 so that's an important thing to keep in, to keep in mind in the classroom. So your, your, your title is what special advisor, what, what is it? What is the whole thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. On- special, special advisor to the president for equity and campus engagement. There we go. All right. So in that role, you are yeah. trying to actually help an entire institution 
uh, move forward in terms of racial justice and equity. What are some of the, the priorities institutionally or some of the institutional changes that you think need to take place in Christian higher ed yeah. to make it racially just and, and equitable? Yeah. Well, one of the things is so and 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 some some universities are farther are farther along um, than others. Um, it begins, I think, with with making it an institutional priority. So so not just as not just not just as this kind of box checking thing, but as it, but as an understanding that especially as Christian colleges and universities, we ought to be we ought to be invested in building just just institutions. This is not a matter of so. So, for example, for, in a number of corporate settings, you may see, "Hey, we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion because, like, it makes us it it makes us make more money." Um, so that's why that's why we do it. Uh, research tells us that we'll that we'll make more money when we do this. So let's let, let's do it. Um, in a number of, for example, secular uh, uh, in, se- in secular university settings, you may see the language of. Well, we're you know we're training students to be kind of multi, multi multicultural citizens in a you know in a in in a in a multiracial de- uh, democracy like that like that that's that can be kind of one of the reasons for do for doing that um, in Christian colleges and universities it ought to it ought to come from it ought to come from who we are as who Christ as who Christ has called us to be that is. You know we're 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 entering a, uh, into a world that is rife with racial violence and trauma, where there are where there are wounds, where there are wounds that need to be healed, where there are people who need to be people who need to be set set free. Um, and so and and in a number of our contexts, you you still have schools that were segregated up until the sixties, and there's and there's harm, both institutional and personal. That's come from that's come from those practices, and there are ways in which these systems need to change um, in order to actually be be welcoming. To be to, to it, it's it, it it's not just enough to say, oh, you can apply and be admitted now. Uh, the question is, like you know, do you do you actually have a hand um, in shaping in shaping the culture of this of this college and university? Um, and so, particularly for Christian colleges and universities, I think we have. I think we have a unique responsibility in this space to bear to bear witness to the world um, what the king like what the kingdom of God can look like that we can actually build institutions that are free of domination and exploitation like that it it's it's a tall it's a tall order because we've been we've been dominating and exploiting each other for a very very long time not just not just in non Christian uh, uh, colleges and universities but in Christian ones. Um, and so, and so when the, when that, when that becomes our, when that becomes our focus, then, then our institutions can begin to, can begin to change. Well, brother Malcolm, you have made it abundantly clear, Dr. Malcolm, uh, you have made it abundantly clear why we needed your voice. And I thank you for your time. What are you working on now and how can people continue to learn from you? Cause I'm sure many people want to, want to keep up this, uh, dialogue. Yeah, so I uh, right now my my dissertation is under is under review with an with an academic press. I'm working on a book proposal. Uh, I'm working I'm working on a book proposal for another book, which will be publicly available. Uh, but that's it's 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 basically looking at uh, racial violence and racial capitalism and how we how we build specifically church communities that resist this cycle of economic exploitation, the violent, the, the violent enforcement of that exploitation, and then like the building of racialized narratives to justify the whole, the whole toxic soup. Um, so basically the question is, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we break that? How do we break that cycle? Um, so I'm, I, I just became a regular contributor for uh, the Anxious Bench blog. So uh, my first, first post was this past Friday. It's titled, But What Do We Do on Race and Political Economy? Uh, so you can check that you can you can you can check that out. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at 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 Malcolm B Foley. Um, but I'm writing, but I'm but I'm writing for that for that blog twice a, twice a month, and and there will be there will be other opportunities to see uh, and also to think to think through with me how how we build how 
it, if our issue is political economy, that is what we think is valuable, where our money goes, how we how we exert whatever political power we have, we have to think about that in terms of Christ Christ's words to J- to 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 James and John when they asked him if he could sit on their it, when when they asked him if he, if they could sit on his right and left hand, and he said, you know, that's not the way that's not the way power it's not the way power works. Um, the son, the, the son of man himself came not to, came, came not to be served, but to serve. Um, if that's to be our ethic, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to rethink, we, 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 we've got to rethink the way we use our money. We've got to rethink the way that we use our power. We've got to think about, we've got to rethink the way that we think of human relationship. Man, I am eager for all of that, that you mentioned. Bless you on your work, brother. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mark.